Okay. Let's uh, start with uh, session number five. Uh, we're going to have a talk by uh, Professor Gabriel Scanze. Uh, Gabriel is a professor in speech communication and technology at KTH in, in Sweden. He's also co founder and chief scientist of Four Hat Robotics. Uh, and he's uh, president of SIGDIAL, the special interest group on discourse and dialogue. He's uh, studies human communication and developing communication models that allow voice assistants and chatbots and social robots to have a conversation with humans involving both verbal and non-verbal communication and aspects of turn taking, feedback, young attention, language grounding, etc. So, thank you. Uh, yeah. So, uh, as we heard, I have a double affiliation. I am uh, both professor at KTH and uh, work at Four Head Robotics. Uh, so, uh, just. One word to start with. Uh, what do we do at Furhat Robotics? So we at Furhat Robotics we develop this uh, robot called Furhat that you might have seen. Uh, it's actually only a robot head, uh, back projected face uh, with a mechanical neck. Um, one of the, of the advantages of this technology is that you can um, portray different uh, personas with it. So you can change the gender and ethnicity and age, or make it look like an alien if you want that. Uh, and uh, I use this robot myself. I mean, we sell it to a lot of universities and research institutes around the world, but I use it a lot myself in my own research. Uh, and this is some example of both sort of where we have tried this in a more commercial setting and for experiments that we are doing it uh, in my research. So, so here was a collaboration with Deutsche Bahn, where Furhat is located at the uh, Berlin train station, giving information. Um, uh, they also deployed it in uh, Tokyo train station and uh, at some airports. Uh, so that, that was very uh, interesting learnings from that. Uh, although it sort of didn't continue, there are not fur hats at every train station. We would have liked that, but that's not the case. Um, and uh, here are some other examples. Here's fur hat playing a game of cards with some um, children. So that we have uh, used to explore uh, multi-party interaction. Um, and situated interaction, and we have also used it to study uh, language learning. So how can you uh, train conversation in a foreign language uh, this way? Here is an example where Furhat is presenting a piece of art to an audience, uh, and it's trying to read the audience uh, reactions in order to adapt the presentations, so see if they are understanding or not what Furhat is talking about. Uh, here's another live experiment we did uh, in a self-driving bus in Stockholm. Um, so the idea is that in the future you won't have uh, humans on board of self-driving buses, that's the point, uh, but then there is nobody to sort of represent the bus or be able to answer questions, etc. So why not have a robot there? So that was what we were exploring in that project. And here is another example where Farhat is conducting a job interview uh, with, with candidates. So a lot of interesting use cases. I'm not going to talk so much about these use cases today, I'm going to focus on a specific aspect because I'm partly interested in the applications, but also in like the core fundamental modeling of conversation. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that is sort of similar for, for all these kind of use cases. And today I'm going to talk about predictive modeling uh, related to turn taking. So of course, predictive modeling is uh, sort of a textbook definition is statistical or machine learning technique used to predict future outcomes based on historical data. So uh, you could predict the stock market or the weather, but I'm interested in uh, predicting a conversation. So uh, try to predict what's going to happen in the next few seconds of a conversation based on what's happened so far, basically. Um, and it's going to be a focus on speech, although human-robot interaction is highly multimodal. Uh, but uh, it, most of, of my focus is going to be on speech today. Um, and why do we want to predict the next few seconds of a conversation? Uh, well, I believe that, uh, and psycholinguists believe, that uh, predictive modeling is crucial for an agent or uh, taking part in an interaction. So you, can, you cannot ha interact properly with someone unless you are able to, to make predictions. Um, 
interesting as a side note, of course, is that predictive modeling is also used for, for agents to learn representations of data. So it's used in sort of self-supervised learning. Uh, and of course, there are theories saying that that's sort of what intelligence is, is the ability to predict the future. Uh, but I'm not going to go into that, but it's an exciting little sidetrack. Uh, so maybe you think that, yeah, predicting the future is exactly what a large language models like ChatGPT is doing, and that's correct. Uh, so uh, you train it a vast amount of data to basically just predict the next token. Um, and by doing that, it learns, again, representations of the data uh, in order to do this task. And it uh, sort of, uh, uh, yeah, it, it learns representation. Thanks to this with transformers, we have these attention mechanisms. So it uh, sort of learns what, which words are connected and so on. And you could say in some sense it learns a model of the world where princess lives in castles, because that will help it to predict the next word. Um, but this is, of course, also very useful for building conversational systems, because we can make it predict the next word, and, and, and you can have a conversation with it. But this is uh, focused on uh, text, and I'm interested in speech. Um, and uh, that's, of course, a quite different thing, and it's easy to forget. Um, so um, I tend to think of written language as a sort of lossy compression of spoken language. The so spoken language is the real deal. Written language is useful for sending letters or s writing stories that can be kept for future generations, but it's not the optimal way of communicating. Um, and uh, of course, uh, written language um, is a, a relatively young invention. Uh, and it's very nice for computers with written language because we have words, letters, spaces, and punctuation, uh, which makes it very nice for computers to process. We have sort of done much of the job for the computer already. Uh, whereas spoken language is continuously, uh, it's continuous, it's highly variable, ambiguous, and noisy. Uh, written language is also typically written, sort of produced asynchronously. So I write my uh, letter or I write my chat message uh, and I'm, when I'm happy with it, I press the return button. Uh, and that's not how spoken communication works, right? We try to think what to say while we are in the conversation. So it's real-time production of what we are saying. It sort of is a continuous stream of events, you could say. Um, yeah, so we, we have a sort of, again, nice for computers, syntactically well-formed. In spoken language, it's disfluent. We might need to stop to think more about what to say. We might repeat ourselves, produce fillers like uh and um, in order to show that I have a little bit more thinking to do before I can continue. Um, and of course, written language is exclusively symbolic and verbal, whereas uh, sort of spoken language has, has sort of non-verbal components, non-symbolic components, uh, which is primarily prosody then, that's the tone of our voice, uh, etc. Um, so how we talk, uh, and of course things like bra uh, laughter and breathing and so on, uh, which is missing. We can replace some of it with emojis and so on, but it's not the same thing. Um, so spoken language is challenging. Uh, and it's also, again, I want to stress again the real-time aspect of spoken language. Um, building a machine, I think, ultimately, that can have a spoken conversation is as hard as building a robot that you could dance with uh, or someone you could improvise music together with or maybe carrying an object together with. Um, and so coordination, this kind of coordination relies on, on the cues and signal in the face and voice and body that we continuously have to send and pick up in order to manage this kind of real-time coordination. Um, and then back to, to the topic, it requires the ability to anticipate or predict the partner's actions um, and also predict consequences of actions, of course. Uh, so purely reactive approaches are not enough. Um, so I'm going to illustrate this by a uh, sort of failed interaction with Furhat. Uh, and uh, instead of showing uh, a happy path, I'm going to show the not so happy path. Uh, of, and, and I think you will realize that this is often how conversations with these systems actually 
uh, work. So let me see. Th this was a, a scenario we were building a companion robot for elderly people or trying it out with elderly people. So it's basically just the large language models in the back end having a conversation with this uh, old lady. Uh, she's Swedish, trying to speak English. Uh, you can see here. But my favorite is probably broccoli. What about you? Yes, I like broccoli too. I use broccoli very often for a soup. And I like. Yes. And I like to. Is a great vegetable to use in cooking. Thank I like you for sharing that with me. I like to cook it in 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 steam. It's better to cook it in steam. Do you do you yes. use? Yes. So you... a great way to cook broccoli. Oh. Thanks for sharing that with me. Mm -hmm. So you can see it's 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 a little bit like dancing with someone who's constantly stepping on your toes, toes, or like trying to meet someone in the street where you don't know if you're gonna go left or right. And, and uh, this is, of course, because we use a much too simplified model of, of turn-taking. Um, so to, to explain the problem uh, a little bit more, uh, it's useful with some terminology. Uh, so you can, you can uh, <coughs> sort of illustrate the conversation uh, using this sort of diarization, boxes um, with speaker A and speaker B. Uh, and you typically find um, some overlap, perhaps, between turns. So this is sort of a between overlap. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, you might also have what we call a gap or a sh gap between turns. So someone was speaking and then the other, there was a little bit of silence and the other person continued to speak. You can have within overlap and that's often like if you do a back channel, like mm -hmm or something, that often like is a little bit of overlapping uh, within uh, uh, someone else speaking. And then you typically also find these pauses or holds. So someone was speaking, making a little bit of pause, and then continue to speak. Um, so one thing, what the most basic thing you might want to distinguish is like, when this person stops speaking here, is this going to be is this supposed to be just a pause uh, or is it supposed to be a shift to the other to the other speaker um, and if if you look at uh, human human data which uh, many people have done this kind of analysis um, and you look at turn transitions uh, they can either have a positive gap so a little bit of silence you could find almost like zero gap between or a negative gap if there is a little bit of overlap between. And then you can plot these offsets in a histogram uh, and count the frequency. And then you typically found this kind of, of pattern. So uh, the modal response time is around 200 millisecond, which is uh, quite incredible how a person can take the turn so quickly. If you think about that, it's not just about figuring out that I was allowed to speak there. It was not just a pause. It was actually my turn to speak. Uh, I have to think about what to say also, right? Uh, uh, and I have to start my articulators in order to be able to produce. So it means that we're not, very not just very good at, at detecting when it's appropriate to speak, but also uh, it seems like we are preparing what to say before this event occurs, right? So we are back to the predictive uh, modeling here. Um, <coughs> most current systems rely on a very simple uh, principle for turn taking. So this is, uh, for example, if I would talk to my smart speaker and say, could you play Rolling Stones? Um, and it uses a silence threshold, could be one second perhaps. Uh, and then it uh, this is a very optimistic diagram because actually after this silence threshold, it's typically tr tries to <laughs> retrieve a response, right? And everyone using an LLM we knows that that will take some time, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, so it's not going to be one second. It's going to be much more. Um, so we are very far off from this 200 millisecond I was showing in human-human communication, right? Uh, what if you try to reduce this threshold then to make it more snappy? Then, of course, what will happen is that you will basically uh, trigger this threshold all the time while the uh, person was just taking a pause, so you will interrupt them. 
uh, this is partly what happened in the video before. Um, and uh, you will get things like this, uh, which people might also have experienced with these systems. So it basically means that silence, that's not a good indicator for turn shifts. That's not what humans use. In fact, if you look at human statistics of human-human turn taking, you will see that if we plot both uh, gaps within turn, and sh that's the hold, and the shift between turns, you will see that they are not telling you whether this is the, the, this length of this pause that we see here. It's not going to tell you whether this is supposed to be a pause or a shift. It's not informative at all, actually. Um, so that's not what we use. Then what do we use? So one thing, way of thinking of this is uh, that we have some kind of traffic signals. Uh, so here's one person speaking. Um, and this has been uh, called transition relevance places in literature from the 70s. Um, and it basically means that, okay, this is, this, is, this is a place where you can take the turn. If I need to pause, I will send a red traffic signal saying a hold. I will say, uh, you are not supposed to take the turn here. Let me think a bit. Uh, and then we are back to, to the green signal again. Sometimes the green signals don't end up in a turn shift. Because I might say it's allowed for you to speak, but you don't have to. If you don't have anything to say, I can continue. I, I invite you to an opportunity to take the turn. So these TRPs, that's the tricky part. You can't always directly see them in the data. They are there somehow, but it's a, a hidden thing. Um, and this has been studied for a long time in linguistics. What are those hold and shift cues or signals? Uh, and uh, if you like multimodal processing and human-robot interaction, you're happy to see that they are all over the place in different modalities. So uh, if you are yielding the turn, you typically have some kind of complete syntactic clause. Uh, but if you would uh, be in the middle of a, cent of a cent sort of syntactic construction, like I would like to have, then that's very clearly turn holding, right? Or if I produce a filler, like, um, that's a very good signal that I'm holding the turn. Um, but you also find it in the tone of the voice, so the prosody in the pitch, rising or falling pitch is more often turn yielding, whereas flat pitch is turn holding. Um, intensity duration also matters. Um, breathing. So if we breathe in, it's more likely that we have something more to say than if we breathe out. We have a gaze. Uh, it's very important if we make a pause and look away, typically signal that we uh, have something more to say, more to, uh, sort of thinking about more to say, whereas if we look up at the addressee, uh, we are yielding the turn more likely. Gestures are also shown to be important here. Uh, and uh, also the more cues, the stronger the signal. So we can combine these cues to, to make it uh, we can also compensate, like, what if we have a complete syntactic clause, but we still have more to think about? Then we can signal that with a flat pitch, for example. Uh, so we can, it's, it's, it's a little bit complicated, of course, how we use this. Um, so this was something we tried to model in uh, this setting that I talked about before. It's almost 10 years ago now. Uh, with a very sort of straightforward approach. So let's yes, try to model this as some kind of supervised uh, machine learning task. Um, so we took a corpus from this setting um, and we um, annotated the data basically. So every time we detected 200 milliseconds of silence, uh, we annotated that uh, saying that, okay, in this case, someone says, yeah, um, that's not a good place to take the turn, so uh, don't take the turn there, uh, robot. Uh, and we said, like this, and someone is like looking at the cards maybe. Uh, it's not so clear. You could take the turn. You don't have to. That's an opportunity. But then someone looks up at the robot and says, what do you think? Uh, and that's an obligation to take the turn, right? We have to take the turn. It would be strange otherwise. Uh, and uh, then we use uh, different... Uh, multimodal signals that we have in the data from the sensors and so on. 
and we can basically train a classifier. Um, and we found that, yeah, if you just use one of these modalities, yeah, we have the annotated data, supervised learning, one of the modalities like head pose, for example, which is sort of a proxy for the gaze, whether they are looking at the robot or not, right? We get a certain performance. Um, if you add more, you get better performance. And if you add everything, you get even better performance. So that was sort of confirming what people had said in the literature on turn taking, that these signals are reinforcing or sort of partly redundant, partly complementary. Um, so, uh, so that was nice, but uh, uh, we also thought that, okay, this is nice, but it's, it's specific now to this training data set. We have trained it specifically on this data set. This will not transfer very well to another setting. Um, um, and it's also, what if you want to do that? Then you have to annotate another data set. Uh, it's not feasible, right, to, to do that. Uh, it's also, again, a, a very reactive approach. So we're waiting for these 200 milliseconds of silence uh, to make this decision. It's not this continuous predictive approach that we w think that humans use. So this is how uh, psycholinguists imagine what is going on. Uh, they imagine that as someone is speaking, we are continuously trying to uh, process that and make predictions um, about when this will end and uh, what you might want to respond if it ends the way you think it will end. Um, and then finally you get this cue th uh, that I talked about, the green signal to go, and then you're ready to just unleash your response. Uh, so that's how, how humans do it. Again, very different from, from computers and robots. Um, and we can find very nice evidence of this in the data. This is from a data set of two humans. One is explaining the route on a map to another human. Um, and you can see how the first person say, the start, have you got an extinct volcano? Uh, and here's the response. Yeah, it's just at the top of it. And you can see how the year here starts even before the word volcano is ended. They start to, to answer the question. So clearly, if you add some time here for thinking, uh, this prediction comes quite early here, as you see. Uh, otherwise, this wouldn't be possible, basically. Um, so uh, then, of course, the question is, can we make these kind of predictions? Can we have a system that uh, while someone is speaking, is making predictions about uh, when to take the turn, but also perhaps uh, even a few steps beforehand, so to speak. Uh, and that raises the question, how to make predictions? What are we supposed to predict exactly? Um, and that's something we have struggled a bit, a bit with. Like, how do you formulate this problem? What are you predicting? Uh, and again, we can turn back to the ChatGPT example. If you have a language model, uh, you are basically predicting the next word. Um, so, and, and the, again, word, as, I, as I said, written text is very nice for computers. It's a discrete uh, set of tokens that you can draw your predictions from. So at every ste step here, you can uh, produce a probability distribution over the next word uh, and see how likely that is. Um, so that's a very nice sort of simple framework, and that's something we started with. Um, so maybe you can just formulate this as a next token prediction task. Uh, so we developed a model uh, four years ago called uh, TurnGPT. Uh, so basically modeling turn taking with a language model. Uh, and now we are forgetting all the nice stuff about speech here. We are simplifying it. We are back to words, uh, but we have to start somewhere. Um, so you could think of turn completion being judged incrementally as the utterance unfolds. So if you have this, what would you like to order? I would like a hamburger with fries and a milkshake. You can see how there are sort of turn completion points, potential turn completion points here, right? Uh, where this utterance could have ended. Um, it's also a bit of context dependence. So if I say yesterday we met, uh, in the park, 
and you have OK, when will you meet again tomorrow? So after yesterday, there is no term completion here, right? You can't just say yesterday and it doesn't mean anything. Uh, but in the context of this question, tomorrow is a completion. So we have this sort of context dependence. Uh, now this turn completion, of course, they are not given in the data. We don't see any turn completion points apart from the actual turn shift that we can see in the data. Uh, but even so, if we just train it on dialog data, the model will give us a, a probability of a turn completion at every point. Uh, so that's what we did. So you, you build a model to, at, to predict the next token, including the turn completion token then. Uh, on dialog data. And it means that if we have this example that I showed you, the blue is our model. Uh, you can see that you get a probability at every word for when a turn shift will, how likely a turn shift is to happen. So yes, here we have very low probability. Yesterday we met is a little bit more but because it could be complete. Uh, in the park, now we have that. Okay, that could be complete. Okay, continue. Uh, okay, when could also be complete, but not when will you, and interestingly, not when will you meet. So taken on its own, okay, when will you meet, it seems like it could be complete, but not in this context. You wouldn't have someone say, yesterday we met in the park, and saying, someone else saying, okay, when will you meet? It doesn't make sense. You, you hear that there has to be something more. Uh, and then we get this very uh, nice spike here. And also interestingly, after tomorrow we get this uh, prediction, but not after yesterday here. So it's clearly context dependent. And if you would put some kind of threshold here, you would see that we could actually predict those points in, uh, of, of when a turn shift uh, should, should happen here. Uh, so that was uh, one step. We also, it also means that we could use this model to uh, actually even before when we are in the middle of a sentence, we can start to roll out the language model and see how likely is it that we are getting closer to a turn shift. Um, so it has had some nice uh, properties, but uh, it's a problem then uh, how to transfer this into the sort of speech domain. Uh, we can of course apply speech recognition and everything, uh, but we are missing a lot. So as we said, speech is made of, of a continuous sound wave. Uh, and we started to realize like, what is it? I mean, when you want to do this, you have to start to define what is a turn. And if you see these kind of patterns that we saw before, it's not super easy to say what the turn start and end. Are these sort of part of the same turn? Or, or is the turn ending here and then this is just a back channel, perhaps? It depends a little bit on the distance here. So by just looking at this speech pattern, it's not super easy to think what, what, what is a turn here. And of course, it's not just about the words. As we know, it's also about the prosody, the timing, etc., that are all lost if we try to just model this in the text domain. So we started to think, how can we model this purely in the speech domain? Uh, how can we make predictions purely in the speech domain? Um, so the way we thought we would do this, we call this voice activity projection. Um, so. Um, Projection meaning projection in time, so uh, prediction in future time. Uh, so we have a sound wave, we have a speech from two speakers here. We slice it up into frames and, and then we do this sort of, uh, we can do this kind of voice activity detection if we want to, to say whether the person is speaking or not. We get this kind of, sort of, again, these diarizationization patterns. And so this is sort of another representation of voice activity uh, during this dialogue. Um, and then we have our model and we try to predict what will happen in the next two seconds of this conversation. Um, so we have our little box here representing the two seconds uh, after the current moment. Um, and we might predict this, that uh, there will be a little bit of activity from blue and then a little bit of silence, and then some yellow will speak here. Um, and uh, we model this box. You see that the, the boxes nearer in the future are sort of smaller than the boxes far away. 
representing the fact that it's easier to predict the near future than the far, far future. So it sort of add more precision in the near future. Uh, and we sort of make this as a discrete problem. So you're trying to guess basically which of all these potential futures are we gonna see uh, at this point. So we have 256 potential futures that we are uh, choosing between here. Um, representing all kinds of turn-taking events. It could be that there is an overlap. It could be that, oh, the next speaker will just make a back channel and then the first speaker will continue, etc., etc. So you sort of, by these boxes and patterns, you capture all kinds of turn-taking related events in the same model. Um, and as you see, we only need very basic data here. We need these voice activity patterns in data and then we can train the model uh, with basically no annotation at all, apart from the fact that we need the ground truth of the voice activity, but that you can also uh, derive automatically. Uh, so that's, that's sort of nice. Uh, this is just a little bit more detailed mo uh, uh, illustration. It's, it's a transformer-based model encoding both audio streams separately and then with some cross-attention. I'm not gonna go into details here. Um, but just to give, give a, an idea. Okay, this was actually trained on uh, many hundred uh, hours of uh, uh, co telephone conversations from two data sets called uh, Switchboard and Fisher, which is Americans talking to each other over the phone. Um, and now I'm gonna show if we apply that to this movie scene from uh, the movie Her. I don't know if you have seen that. Uh, it's a nice movie. Uh, with a man that uh, falls in love with his uh, voice assistant. Um, and uh, it's a lot of uh, long pauses, which I like from a turn-taking perspective, because it's interesting to see what the model does there. Um, so we're going to see uh, the speech activity of the two speakers. Um, this uh, is a sort of a summary of the prediction in the boxes. So it basically says that if we, in the current movement here, Ha are a lot on the yellow, it means that it will think that it's a very high probability of yellow to speak in the near future. Whereas with blue, it's, it's a high probability that blue will speak. If it's in the middle, it means that it's unclear who will speak next, basically. Uh, so I'm gonna just play and pause and explain a little bit. Um. Hello, I'm here. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Hi. How you doing? <laughs> I'm well. How's everything with you? Pretty good, actually. So you can see here that uh, during these long pauses, it still thinks that he has the turn. He's not sort of completed. But you can see that already when he's approaching the end of the turn, the model predicts that blue will be the next speaker. So it's doing this predictive modeling that uh, we wanted the model to have. Interestingly here, you see that it, it thinks that blue should speak, but uh, that yellow should speak. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, and if you listen to it, it actually sounds like uh, that could have been a place to take the turn. But of course, again, it's predicting who could take the turn, not necessarily who actually takes the turn. Um, so so that's, that's an important thing to, to say. It's really nice to meet you. Yeah, it's nice to meet you too. Again, an opportunity. <laughs> Oh, what, what do I call you? Do you have a name? Or? Um, yes. Samantha. Hey, where'd you get that name from? I gave it to myself, actually. How come? Because I like the sound of it. Samantha. Wait. Yeah, here you see also how the model, a very long silence, and you can see how the model gradually shifts the probability back to, to her. Uh, and of course, as soon as he starts to speak again, the probability falls back to him. When did you give it to yourself? Well, right when you asked me if I had a name, I thought, yeah, he's right, I do need a name, but I wanted to pick a good one. So I read a book called How to Name Your Baby, and out of 180,000 names, that's the one I like the best. Wait, you read a whole book in the second... Okay, so that gives Hello. the fl flavor of the model. Uh, the nice thing uh, with this model is that, again, just to re reiterate, it operates on raw audio. We are using uh, pre-trained contrastive predictive coding, so that's a self-supervised feature extraction that is, again, completely 
uh, trained without any sort of annotation or anything. Um, we don't need to do any speech recognition to the, get the words or feature extraction that you did in the old days to get prosody and so on. Uh, so we don't have any features that we need to normalize, etc. And we get this very nice continuous modeling without virtually no delay. Um, and we only need lightly annotated data, the binary voice activity detection, uh, which means that we can train it on very large amounts of data if we want to. Uh, but, of course, this is a black box model, it's trained end to end. So, uh, what is the model actually doing here? Uh, wh what has it picked up? So, we have actually spent uh, a fair amount of time trying to uh, figure that out. <laughs> what is it that the model has learned? Um, and uh, we found experiments that uh, psycholinguists had used on humans to figure out what they are using uh, <laughs> to do this kind of task. Uh, so they were using these contrastive uh, uh, pairs of, of, sen uh, of, of sentences. <clears throat> so if someone would say, so did you drive here this morning? Or so did you drive here? Uh, you see that there is a point here where in, a, in the text domain they are identical, right? Uh, but this one continues and this one doesn't. And what they showed was that humans understands already here whether it will continue or not. Uh, so even though textually they are identical at that point, humans hear the difference. You can do this by asking humans to press a button when they think it will soon end, for example. Um, and of course we wanted to see, will our model also do that? Because then it means that it's really picking up on some uh, quite subtle prosodic differences. Uh, so actually we synthesized these kind of sentences, uh, which is again a bit different from the training data because that was like conversational data. <coughs> but we still got sort of the results that we wanted. So if I play to you these two examples from a synthesizer, uh, so did you drive here this morning or so did you drive here? It sounds like this. So did you drive here this morning? So did you drive here? Um, so I don't know if you heard the difference before up to the point here, but you can sort of see it in the, this is the pitch, this is the uh, tone of the voice. You can see that's slightly different pattern uh, in this case and this case up to the moment of here. Uh, but you can also see the prediction of the model that in this longer case, the model thinks that blue here will continue to have the turn while it correctly predicts that the turn will shift when we are close, getting closer to the end. And here it cor correctly predicts that we are getting closer to the end already here. So you see the clear dif difference here in the model's predictions. So it does what we want it to do, basically, even though they are two very, very similar uh, stimuli. We also try to see if what happens if you then try to corrupt the signal. Uh, so we have this example here. Yeah. Are you a student here at this university? So again, we have, are you a student here? Or are you a student here at this university? Pair. And now we can flatten the pitch. Uh, are you a student here at this university? Uh, and you can see how the model gets confused here. Uh, so clearly it uses pitch, right? And we can even low pass it to see, is it, because with low pass you only get pitch and nothing else. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and that uh, sort of doesn't, it, it doesn't allow it to make a prediction before uh, the turn actually ends. So, so there is information both in, in the pitch and, um, uh, and in the more sort of higher frequencies. And we also thought that you can actually use this model to answer interesting questions because you can do counterfactual uh, counterfactual examples. So uh, we asked ourselves, sort of uh, people had done that before, so how much time does a filler buy you? So if you do a, an um, how much time does that buy you in a conversation? Uh, and now we can answer that question with a model. Uh, so uh, if we have an example here. Uh, I guess yeah. what worries me about capital punishment is... Uh, so. Uh, I guess what worries me about capital punishment is, uh, um, and then we can just cut away the um. Uh, 
I yeah. guess what worries me about capital punishment is... Uh, and you can s then measure... So this is, if we allow the model to run uh, through this, w this is artificial silence. Of course, it wasn't that much silence, but we just insert silence. Uh, and uh, allow the model to run, and it, it, you see that it buys him around four, four, four seconds of, si uh, of sort of uh, turn here. But uh, if we cut it away, it's only one second. So we, s we can measure the effect of that uh, filler. And uh, uh, interestingly, we, we could then analyze like what are the properties of the filler that uh, buys you time or not. And we found that uh, the prosody, the, the way you produce the filler, gives different results. So if you, if you have a high intensity, high pitch, uh, longer duration filler, it buys you more time, basically. So if I do, um, I will buy myself more time than if I do, um, uh, so that's, that was sort of interesting. Uh, finals, I should say that there is a, uh, there is a, another aspect now, sort of most of the work on turn taking has been about how do we know that the user has yielded the turn, but there is another side of the coin. So what about the system's own turn-taking signals that it gives to the user. Uh, so if I have uh, this conversation, another example, do you have any ABBA compilation? Yes, I have ABBA Gold. Do you want me to play that for you? Um, now, this is some kind of syntactic completion point, right? But the system has more to say. Uh, so we can easily get confusion here. Uh, if the user thinks that the system is done here, uh, you could get this kind of clash again. So if the system doesn't produce the right turn holding or yielding signal, we can also get a problem. And the synthesizers of today have no clue about this. Th that's not modeled at all as an aspect of the synthesis. Uh, so we actually did some studies on uh, applying the model to the synthesis signal to see what kind of signals does it get and uh, give? And I can play here, for example. Again, we have like a sen uh, first a statement and then followed by a question, just like in the previous example. I'm sorry, there are no matches for what you are looking for. Would you like something else? And you can see, according to our model, the turn is yielding here uh, in the pause, which it's not supposed to do. So the user might very well start responding here uh, at the same time as the system is continuing what it's saying. Yeah. But you can actually influence this, so if you insert, uh, use a comma between them instead of a, a period, uh, we get uh, for the sort of at least more forward-looking prediction, uh, it, it doesn't yield the turn as, as clearly. Uh, I'm sorry there are no matches for what you are looking for. Would you like something else? So it's slightly different. Um, um, and of course you can insert a filler. And the model is very sure that uh, the system will continue after the pause. I'm sorry there are no matches for what you are looking for. Um, would you like something else? Uh, so, uh, and we used it. Th this is another synthesizer that never yields the turn according to the model. It just keeps it. Because another thing that we want to see, of course, is that the model, it yields it already before it's ending, right? We want that effect so that the user can start planning their response. If we want to be a cooperative system. Uh, but here is a system that never yields at all, according to the... I market. have found two restaurants in the center of town that serve Turkish food. Would you like me to book a reservation at one of them? So it's, it's sort of this very unclear prosodic signals. Um, so, in the end, I think this is... Th there is a lot we need to do on both the input side and the output side of our systems to be able to allow for this kind of, of turn-taking that humans do. Uh, this is just a, a picture of a traditional dialogue system architecture where you have speech recognition, that natural language understanding, dialogue management, generation, and then speech synthesis here back to the, to the user. Of course, nowadays you would perhaps just replace all of this with a large language model. It doesn't matter for my point. Uh, my point is that this, these two processes are completely detached of the context in which they are doing their task. Um, or almost completely, I would say. 
The speech recognizer just gets uh, an utterance without any context. It's trying to s figure out what was said. It's throwing away a lot of interesting information. Uh, and it's typically this is the box that is supposed to do the turn taking uh, prediction, typically just using a silence threshold. Um, and the synthesizer doesn't have any information in the context in which this utterance will be produced. Um, and it's often trained on like read speech, like trained on monologue uh, audiobooks or something. Um, and the system doesn't listen to itself. It doesn't, it doesn't model how this comes out in order to hear what signals have I actually sent to the user. Uh, so I think this is, uh, the, we need to rethink the way we build these systems. Uh, and I think we should have something a little bit more along those lines. And this is something we are working on. Uh, you should process the user speech using a turn-taking model. Uh, you should figure out all the time how close are we to the end of the user's turn. You need different systems. One system that can start to produce uh, the start of an utterance quickly. Uh, and you need another system, maybe call them system one and system two, uh, that thinks more slowly and that, uh, uh, that can sort of look in, up in the database and do all that, that slow talking. And then you need to combine these and be able to have a system that can start to speak already uh, when the user is, is done speak, when we have detected that the user is done speaking. And we need to be able to self-monitor, to listen to the system is listening to its own speech in order to know what's actually going on here. Uh, so to sum up, problem, problems with today's systems, uh, they are not able to understand the user's turn taking cues, um, whether they are yielding or holding, or whether they are just uh, inviting a back channel. Uh, th they are uh, purely reactive. They don't start planning in time. Uh, they can't start to speak before knowing what to say. Uh, they cannot distinguish user interruptions from back channels. So if the user says something like, mm -hmm, uh, and you would want the system to know whether is that a back channel or the user attempting to interrupt me. Uh, with a model like this, you could, you could try to do that. Uh, and again, systems are not aware of their own speech output. It might accidentally yield or hold the turn in the wrong places. Um, so uh, what we are working on uh, now and we want to work on is to take this model uh, and again make it into an interactive system. A little bit of a problem is that it's quite heavy uh, now, uh, running on a GPU. Uh, so, uh, so, of course, it would be nice to see how much we can compress the model. Um, we have a recently accepted paper where we have uh, trained the model on the different languages, English, Mandarin and uh, Japanese, to compare and see if we can do multilingual. Um, another path is, of course, to move this into the multi-party, multimodal domain. So this is another PhD student now working on that. Uh, so if we have scenarios, we have data like this. This sort of reminds a lot about the speaker diarization ization that we heard about before. But this is speaker diarization ization in the future. So what will the speaker diarization ization look like in the next two seconds, basically? And, and that way you could have a robot that can have a conversation with many people, can predict, is this person likely to just yield the turn to the other person or to the robot, etc. And... I sort of dismiss this text model, but it does have advantages because you can model more long-term sort of semantic relationships. So maybe we should combine these. Um, working uh, this model into the speech synthesis process in order to be able to control the synthesis, the turn yielding and turn holding signals. Um, and I think that the model can be used also as a tool to gain insights into human-human dialogue. Um, I showed a little bit with a sort of you can do studies on uh, how much time does a filler buy you. That can be interesting, not just for us, but also for people working in, in phonetics and linguistics and so on. But maybe you can use the model to diagn for diagnosis to see how people are behaving. Are they uh, doing the turn taking signals that uh, the model would expect or are they deviating from that? Uh, and also, of course, to find different interaction styles, etc.
Um, if you want to read more, I have written a uh, quite comprehensive review uh, in uh, the journal Computer Speech and Language about this whole topic. Uh, you can read. And finally, I would also like to thank uh, my PhD student, Eric Ekstedt, who had done a lot of the modeling. And he just finished uh, recently his uh, thesis on this topic. And now, thank you. your talk and I would like to ask something related to the experiment you show us uh, with the lady the Swedish lady talking to the the furat and I was wondering my uh, impression was that also the time reaction of the robot was somehow influencing the turn taking because the robot was quite slow and this was also my impression for other like interaction with the robot they are usually a little bit slow in processing what they receive and so the lady was adding more information to the conversation because there was this like uh, silence moment. So what do you think about that? Would that be also predictable from the from the model? Thank you. Yeah, the, that sort of again we, we have this sort of uh, silence threshold uh, to find when when she has finished a turn. But after that, you have to add all the extra processing. And in this case, using a large language models, that is not always so fast. Uh, that adds some seconds, perhaps even. Uh, and by that time, during that time, she, as you say, she sort of wonders what is happening here. Why doesn't re uh, the robot respond? Maybe I should amend my request or repeat myself. And just as she starts speaking, the robot is done and ready to speak. And the robot is not aware that she has started to speak again. So they start at the same time. Um, uh, and of course, you would like the robot then to, to not start speaking. Uh, but that's quite tricky also to do. Um, and uh, again, if you don't have a proper model, what if she was just coughing or something? The model, would, the robot would just start speaking, but then stop, and it would be very confusing. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it, the the long, res of course, the long response time also adds. So some things you can do that we have experimented with that I didn't show here is that, of course, if you have a human robot, you can signal those things in other modalities. So if the robot knows that you have stopped speaking and is thinking about what to say, you can signal that by having the robot gaze away, for example, uh, to make it look like it's thinking. Uh, and that will let you know that, okay, it actually, even though there is a very long silence, I, it seems to have, have got that I asked the question and it's just thinking about its answer. So. Yes, sure, there are some non-verbal signs that can be yeah. used to, yeah. And I have also another question. So mm, you mentioned that, but probably I've, I've missed a part, uh, in which you say that also the mm, supportive uterans is somehow like people nodding or like, mm, like encouraging the, yeah. the speak out. Is that also um, analyzed by the model? or can be analyzed by the model as well. Yeah, so, so the model makes correct predictions about uh, like both when it's appropriate to make a buck channel, it will, it will say because it, it's, a cert one, uh, it's a certain pattern where someone is continuing speaking, the other one says something short and continues. So that's sort of one of these predictions is sort of a back channel predictor. Uh, but it, so that's one side of the coin. The other one is that if someone just starts to produce speech, the model can predict whether that's gonna be just a short back channel or whether it's gonna be something longer an attempt to take the turn basically and those are very different because if you detect that someone is just starting a back channel you shouldn't stop speaking you should just continue uh, whereas if you if, if you detect that someone is just about to try to take the turn and of course if you want to allow them to do that uh, you should you should gracefully stop speaking and, and hand over the turn of course yeah. thank you Any other questions? Yeah, um, thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, I, I wonder the the, um, uh, the turn talk turn information was that part of the data set? I mean, allocated or is it uh, is it 
the voice no. activity detection that we use. The the talk term, you know, the one you predicted, but it, was this uh, allotated as well in the data when you train the model? No, no, all of that comes from directly from the uh, from the data itself. I mean, uh, these labels are mm. just given in the data. If you know the voice activity, you know the voice activity here. Okay. Uh, uh, so these are just given by the data. You're basically just predicting how the voice activity is going to continue All in right. the next two seconds. But what happens if you uh, have a noise there? Uh, it's normally it's harder, right? The uh, yes. Yeah, so, so again, you need this kind of voice activity uh, annotation to be correct mm. from the start. Mm. Uh, I mean, a little bit of noise might be fine, but uh, uh, so in these data sets, that information, we have that information because someone has annotated it. You, you can try to extract that with mm. just normal voice activity detection um, offline. So uh, it doesn't have to be a continuous process. It could be something which is very process heavy. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we do need these labels somehow mm. uh, in the data. So yeah. in, in real conversations, sometimes uh, maybe both um, speakers, they're not certain whether to take the turn. What was that uh, issue there? I mean, I, I see that uh, in some of the predictions, you say, oh, that, that speaker should take the turn, but mm. essentially it's not. And yeah. there might be um, a few uh, time frames where neither of the speaker want to take the turn. Yeah. Sorry, I should just clarify the previous question. We don't need to extract this at uh, inference time. It's only for training that we need those labels, yeah. not when we run the model. It, it runs just on audio and mm. it can even be crosstalk between them. It has learned to ignore that. Mm. Uh, so that was just a clarification of, of your previous question. Mm. Uh, for the second question, yeah, it's, it's like we, we don't have any sort of we don't say that someone should have taken the turn. It's more like someone could have taken the turn. It, there was an invitation for you to take the turn. Mm. So, of course, now that we use the model in a system, we have to define what should the robot do now that it's invited. It doesn't necessarily mean that the robot has to take the turn or should mm. take the turn. Uh, you might want to condition that on whether the robot has something to say, especially in a multi-party interaction, right? Mm. You, you, you might be an opportunity for you to jump in, but if you don't necessarily have something to contribute with, you don't necessarily want to take that opportunity. Mm -hmm. But of course, what you don't want to do is to take the turn where you're not supposed to. Uh, so, so yeah, th there is definitely a, a sort of, there is some agency that has to come into the equation as well. The model owner predicts what's possible, not what you necessarily should do. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hi. Thank you for, for the talk. Uh, what will happen in multi-party? You mentioned that it's uh, ongoing work, but if there are several people talking with the robot, then everything will become much more complex. All the turn taking between yeah. the between the humans and the robot. Yes. Can you uh, say something? It's now? it's much more complicated. Uh, <laughs> so uh, first of all, these boxes, uh, the combination assumes two speakers so uh, and we wouldn't want to expand this into like <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we would want uh, to have one of these predictions per speaker so it would be like me versus the rest so you can model each speaker as me versus the rest um, and then you can sort of com compare these different predictions and then it scales more nicely so that's how we're gonna model in the uh, multimodal that we are working on now uh, which is the uh, uh, this scenario so we have these kind of, of data uh, so we are basically trying to say for each person in the video we're trying to make turn-taking predictions for that person basically versus the other persons in that video yeah um, so you, you you did list all, a lot of cues to detect turn taking. You explored a few of them, including gaze in the in the study you were showing. But then now you're completely focusing on on prosody or like let's say the audio signal. Do you think it's still worth going back to including more multimodal cues like the gaze, for instance? Yeah. So so w when we transfer to this situation, we will have gaze. So basically, we will do the same task, but then we have both audio and video data. 
So the model will probably learn gaze signals in conversation by doing this task, uh, if as long as it can extract that from the video. Uh, so, so that's definitely uh, will be part of the equation. Okay. Any idea how you might like merge both gaze and and and? I, and I think we can just uh, feed that into the model. Just like now, we only have speech features, but uh, we basically are working now with uh, face embeddings that are supposed to contain both facial expressions and also head pose, uh, et cetera, in those face embeddings. So that's going to go. Again, it will be an end-to-end -end model, so then we have to figure out what did it actually pay attention to. But uh, all of that information should be possible to feed into the model, just like we feed this sort of speech representations into it. Sorry. So I have one question about forehead. It has a depressed character, Marvin, and I wanted to ask what is the idea behind building this character? Because it is so different than the cheerful robots that we are used to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, th that was just made for fun. Okay. okay. Um, I guess it was uh, to show the wide spectrum of different personalities and different emotions that the robot can express. And I, I think we it's it's fun to explore other situations than the typical one. But yeah. again, that was more for entertainment purposes. <laughs> one last question. Quick. No? Okay, so let's thank Gabriel again. Good. Okay, so I will finish this session. Uh, I'm uh, Daniel Hernandez from Herowat University, and uh, I'm going to talk about what we have done in uh, the World Package 5 on multi user spoken conversations with robots. Uh, so the, the idea and the goal was to develop a multi user conversational with the robot and multiple humans with uh, the ability to have a, a high level planner that uh, could coordinate. Uh, both spoken and, and nonverbal uh, behaviors and actions from the robot, and also have uh, situated multi-party interactions. So you saw a little bit, uh, I mean, it wasn't exactly the same system, but uh, seems like you say goodbye to the robot, no, that uh, needs to create a, a plan action of, of a robot action that's not a spoken dialogue. So we have a, an integrated system of combining physical and, and dialogue actions. Uh, and then we have, uh, we develop a conversational intelligence system, first in a traditional way, and then we, we throw that all out and move to LLMs. So the first system was uh, based on, and it's, uh, it's called Alana in, uh, I think it was 2018 or 2019, I'm not sure, it was before I joined HeroWatt. We, part HeroWatt uh, group participated in a Amazon bot competition and they were second place or third place. Uh, with this uh, Alana bot, so we use this as a base architecture for, for future uh, projects. Uh, the idea is, is a traditional national language, national education pipeline. We have uh, very different bots to, to handle very different uh, cases. So for spring, we, we added new bots for different tasks, like giving directions in the hospital or providing information around the hospital. And, and we also have bots for having some general chit chat kind of talk, uh, a coherence bot that is used to, to drive the conversation when when it's not really, like when people ask things that are not really making sense into any of the other bots for the specific task to kind of to try to keep going. Uh, yeah, so use uh, uh, an NLU based on, on RASA and this uh, ensemble family of, of bots to answer different type of tasks and a dialogue manager uh, and a template-based type of energy to, to give certain answers. We are limited into what could be spoken to when it's outside of the scope. Uh, we tested uh, the different times, uh, web-based uh, fears uh, for our partners in the hospital and to try it out and to find different use cases. Uh, we had for, uh, for a time, because the project started in 2020 for so for the first two years, we were working in a Corona bot uh, that was answering specific questions about the, about the coronavirus and about the regulations and limitations uh, 
by the government and the hospital. So facilities about catering and uh, yeah, also visual type of, of dialogue. We have, I'm not going to talk about the experiment, but uh, we have been testing it uh, a long time and people were mostly positive. Like when things were okay, the task completion when for questions around the hospital was around 72%, but when things didn't work well, it didn't work well uh, at all, very strict, because they're not able to handle things out, outside of the, the domain where, where we train it on the data that we got. So it was so then uh, when the LLMs come, we we started working on, on an replacing all the architecture with an LLM. We're using right now the Vicuna 15 million, the Vicuna 1.5 with a 13 million parameters, which is what you saw in the demo from, I forgot your name, but <laughs> uh, we tested uh, uh, at the time uh, very different models, like Falcon 7 billion, uh, the family of Llama, first one, then uh, Llama 2 came up, then all the Vicunas, and uh, tested and just how well they were to answer the type of questions we have around the hospital and decided one that was working the best for us. Uh, we implemented using uh, fast chat from LNCs, this is an open platform for for having a, for developing, a, not development, but for, for serving a, a large language model. Uh, it gives us a, an OPI, open AI type of server that we can use so everything we could work. We could test things also with uh, open AI and test it in, in a different open source uh, models. So we choose to, we, we need to have an open source uh, model. We cannot use use open AI chat GPT because uh, this was going on in the hospital. There's uh, privacy concerns. Uh, there's a lot of things you don't know about uh, how open AI will use the data, how is you, what data is used for training. So we wanted a, an open source solution that we could host and, and run in, in our own campus. Uh, and we are also using BLLM as a as a server. It's uh, use uh, attention key value memory with patient attention to make it faster. Uh, it still is not uh, super fast, but we managed to have a completion time for requests uh, between two seconds and six seconds. So it's kind of good enough to have a real time interaction. It's still a bit slow, but we hope people are patient. <laughs> We created the uh, templates uh, prompts in both in, in French and in English, uh, trying to give the robot a type of small personality. It's a robot in a hospital clinic. It, it tries to only answer patients about the their visit on the clinic today, the, trying to help them out to be providing jokes or reader or something for entertainment for their time in the waiting room, which could be very long. Uh, and also answer general questions about how things work in the hospital. I don't think I should go through <laughs> specific examples, but so uh, the good things about the LLM is it can answer things that were completely outside of, of scope, like since uh, is it raining outside, there was no way in a traditional system that we could provide answer for that kind of question, which will not have come up when in any training data what we have in, in our use case. But now the data lens are able to have more general things and talk more in the outside domain. So so we went from, from a system that uh, have uh, in the outside domain 100% uh, wrong or no information and it was always answering, oh, sorry, I don't understand the question or sorry, I cannot answer that type of questions to, to a system that uh, Sometimes it, it works well, but we still have 28% of, of hallucination of wrong information that the, the LLM still generates and, and give answers that are not proper, even though we give them the data and the constants about things in the hospital. Uh, and then we've been working on a multi-party dialogue, like uh, we said. So multi-party dialogue is, is just not the same to having n number of dialogues in parallel. It's a complete different type of, of dynamic. It, it makes the tone thinking much more complicated. Uh, we need to track the state of, of each of different users, uh, who are there, what the goals they have, what type of uh, information they want, uh, 
Expo is part of the conversation and the turn taking also becomes much more more complicated. We have the, uh, certain uh, phenomena that were not happening in, in single party conversations like a, a second participant could provide the answer to or complete the sentence for 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 the for the first user taking their turn even like sometimes not even when it was their turn not they just completely you especially in in our use cases in the hospital where it's uh, our idea is to have a an elderly patient and uh, the companion this uh, family members so they they both know the the answer sometimes they will interrupt more to 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 give in the contents uh, the cells uh, reparations uh, uterine completions uh, we through the direction of the spring project we have very different data collections and uh, experiments that so seem surreal talk about the data collection part uh, yesterday uh, so in many different ways to the experimentation with the help from the APHP hospital personnel. We have, uh, we created a, a scenario of, uh, we give the participants some pictogram information of, of certain goals or certain uh, information they should try to obtain from, from the robot. We use pictograms instead of giving them explicit uh, text information so that they can we are not biasing, trying to get them to speak more as naturally as possible from, from these questions to get uh, more possible data. So we have the first uh, phase was uh, Wizard of Oz, and, and then later it has been with a full system in the robot. Uh, we have annotated this uh, data from to find different phenomena, uh, especially trying to have uh, uh, the goal uh, tracking and, and goal recognition and intention recognition from from these uh, conversations. It's more on the annotations. And then we wanted to find out if 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 an LLN could be able actually put this people if an LLN could be able to to keep track of different goals in a multi party conversation using this data. So we work uh, based on the work of uh, the dialogue LED uh, task for, for training this uh, this uh, language model. So they use uh, they mask certain information for different tasks. So the speaker mask you, you give the you give the dialogue to the system, but mask who is uh, the person speaking and is is able to predict who was in the in the conversation or for uh, the turns or formation. So we created two new tasks for for the goal tracking and uh, intense thought masking in, in multi-party conversations using the data set uh, collected from from the hospital data. And uh, this you have been before. And we tried uh, with ChatGPT, and uh, we haven't finished. We're now trying with the uh, Llama open source with six different type of, of plants. So you have basic plant that gives the information, one that gives some specific data about what the tasks are, uh, a story type wrong with the uh, uh, fictional scenario for the LLN to try to figure out the task. Uh, we find out that the reasoning type of, of task uh, of wrong was the most effective. It was able 62% of the time in the goal tracking and 69% on the intestinal recognition to match in those results. And we couldn't get uh, almost any, we compared it to a uh, fine tune T5 system or the dialogue LED, fine tune on the, in the data. And uh, those were never able to to have almost any success, but the, the GPT uh, LNN was able to, to figure out this task at least 69% uh, of the time. Uh, and but the idea is to to have the system for multi-party conversation that we have different type of prone systems. One, so we're going to use uh, the gaze information as a to, as a helpful for uh, the turn taking to see, like uh, Scanty said, when, when the person will be looking at the robot, it's most likely that is the turn of the robot. So we have a classifier to see if uh, if they have spoken at partial utterance or not, if they are. Uh, if they have a signaling that the robot should take the turn or not, 
and when so to decide to decide when the robot should speak or not in the multi-party conversation, uh, and then have the hospital information from, and that's uh, what we're going to text next in from here to the direction of the project. Um, yeah, then I have some image on all experience on, on lunch and was models, so they are uh, an amazing tool that uh, it does a lot of things that we couldn't have done before, but they also are, uh, they just come up with uh, <laughs> with whatever they want. It's they hallucinate, even though we really try hard to, to keep them on, on, on the knowledge that we're given in the hospital, they still come up sometimes with very random information. So it's very tricky to use them. It's not reliable at all for commercial applications, I think, right now. There's things like, I asked it, I have always asked it what day it is. Like, of course, we can give the day information as part of the prom, and that could solve that particular problem. But I just enjoy asking that question because 99% of the time, he always answers, I do not have information of what there is today. One day, for some particular reason, he told me that it was uh, Thursday, April 21st, 2023. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know where he come from. Uh, so yeah, they are uh, experts uh, predicting next turn in the conversation, but uh, that next token that could be, there's no, it's very hard to control sometimes where it will go, uh, especially once you start a conversation going into information that should not be there, that is, you will need to clear that from the from the system. Uh, when we were trying to, to work on on detecting incomplete sentence, uh, incomplete utterance, so that we know the, uh, as a turn taking as also to provide clarifications and also to help sometimes the ASR not fully recognizing a uh, word. We get sometimes stuck in places where, uh, where even though we give a, a full sentence, I would like to have a coffee, the system gets talking, sorry, what as the coffee, sorry. He never <laughs> removed itself from the not being an incomplete sentence. Uh, he give, uh, even factual information on things that everyone, the Ireland population know, like the capital of France was uh, Avignon in a quiz game that we were playing, and he said it was right, which is a, another type of problem they have. They're, uh, they're very likely to agree with what you're saying. No? Uh, so we try to give uh, safety things, like not give medical information or not tell you, should I take a paracetamol? The, the system should never tell you yes, because it should not try to give this information, but you can always trick them and you can always force them to ask things in a way because they try to be nice, they try to say yes to things, they try to keep things going that will give you the information, the answer that you want that should be an answer that you never give. So yeah, there's a, there's a, they're both a blessing and a blight for science. And that was the last thing I have. Questions? Hello. Uh, thank you for the present. Here, here. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, could you elaborate a bit more on the process of selecting, like the LLM, the because you you have uh, several LLMs, right? Yeah. Uh, could you elaborate a bit more what did you do, like kind of test or the, to allow, you know, how did mm -hmm. you evaluate like the model that you are going to use? Yeah, so we have, uh, but we have part of this, uh, we have data that we have been collecting from all this time, which is from where uh, this table came from. Uh, so we have these data, so we we selected that data of 100 utterance to, to test on on things that are questions that we have found already as during the first uh, years of, of the project and see how accurate they were to actually provide the right answer in those cases or, or and how, uh, how good they were in providing the out of domain information that wasn't being hallucinated. So we tested like that and the other criteria that we use uh, it was uh, we needed to be able to run it so we choose the 13 billion parameter model because that one could run uh, and in the gpus that we have in only one machine 
who have four GPUs, uh, and it was also fast enough to be happy with a two second, six second delay, which is not great, but the, so those were the, the criteria that we used, know, how fast it, it was in implementation, the size of it, because some, some of them, we could run it, but we could only run it by hacking, by yeah. using all the GPUs, and those need to be shared with everyone else on the <laughs> campus. Uh, and, and how well they performing in our both in domain and out of domain utterance that we collected from the first part of the project and just manually annotated the response. All right, thank you. Other questions? Uh, it's not a question, but just a point about the last uh, slide. It's uh, about the mistake of uh, Ari. Yes. Um, I do the experiment in yeah, the yeah, Volga, I mean, so... You have way more uh, mistakes <laughs> than the ones I collected. Um, I saw during the experimentation that um, all the dudes uh, who has a cognitive, and, uh, cognitive um, yeah, disability, yes. <laughs> um, for example, it could be fun and it could be complicated to have a bad answer because, for example, what is the capital yeah. of France? Um, some people could be things that he do a mistake and uh, for example, yes, Avignon is the, the right capital of France and uh, it's complicated, for example, uh, during, um, during uh, assessment, uh, Ari said, uh, give me an animal uh, who begins with uh, the letter A, uh, yes, a snake. Oh yes, it's great, <laughs> and uh, the accompanying person and the patient uh, look uh, them, and she say it's right or really uh, a snake uh, beginning with A. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's really fun, but uh, it could be complicated. Yeah, it's part of of the risk uh, and the information. Uh, the still has on, on on trust in robotics that we use. Uh, we over trust these systems. Uh, like we just assume it's going to be right. So, like that, they you start thinking, if I'm wrong or something that is you are, it's obviously you're obviously right, and you kind of know it's right, but you believe the system should be perfect. So you start uh, assuming that you are wrong, and that's a huge risk, uh, which is uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> There's many techniques that you try to keep them accurate, no? and uh, some of them, uh, which which uh, like you have post verification type of step, but that will add more time in the. It's already slow at uh, two six seconds. You, if you start adding post verification step, you got a system that cannot be cannot be used on real human robot interactions. So yeah, it's a big challenge uh, that I don't have solution now. Hi, thank Hi. you. Okay. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very informative. I have a couple of questions. The first question was like, in terms of the architect, so my research is like, how do we represent knowledge? And so I know like in your diagram, you had like KBs. I'm like, is that a knowledge base? Like, I wanted, I'm just curious, what, what was that in your diagram? Was that like an owl knowledge base or what was that? Don't remember, but <laughs> which... <laughs> So it's like in the beginning, oh, even that one, yes, KB. You have ah, a yeah, so that's uh, uh, that's in the in the planner system. There's uh, uh, some predefined recipes of, of plans that the so so for example, what what to do when someone says goodbye. So I'm just looking at that thing that looks like a database. So not your planner. Yeah, yeah, but, but so so that that they with. It, that database is uh, wait, is some some of it is yeah, information that has been acquired from from so from the environment, but the, it's, it's inform is is that's a knowledge base for for a plan. So it is a knowledge base, right? Well, I mean, it KB is a database of things that are known or, or facts that are important so for for that plan. So, for example, like I think was it like knowing what. Like the robot, you say goodbye, it needs to go back to the central station. So, so that point that represents the central station will be in that knowledge. But like I, it's just 
I completely get that. I guess I was just trying to figure out what the structure was because it's like, so I looked at one of your slides. I took some pictures. I hope that's yeah. okay. <laughs> I'm taking pictures. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's in the <laughs> so because like you have a couple of predicates in there and then, um, so I, I assume that you created possible predicates. Like you have a sit down, you have acknowledge, and then you have this, L um, this LLM. And I'm assuming that you've tried to contextualize, right? some some phrases that pertain to maybe this is a go-to location so i'm just curious to know if the method for that acquisition was based on some kind of semantic ontology which was your kb and then you were using that to map to it's that not, and then to the task planner it's not that uh, okay it's not that elaborate <laughs> yeah sure yeah So as a matter of fact, we have uh, OWL based ontology, the one you know, knowledge core that is running in the system and is connected to the people perception pipeline. But that's not that one. Uh, that's yeah. probably one of the remaining gaps in our in our architecture. It, for a long time, we had planned to con properly connect the chatbot with this kind of knowledge based component. The one that is there is purely based uh, it's purely used by the planner to have the, the facts required by the planner. In principle, that's that's the, the big picture involved the knowledge uh, OWL knowledge base, but it's not the case here. All right. Um, so I do have one question because uh, what uh, Daniel did not explain is that uh, uh, on this conversation manager, there is a lot of other information that goes to this, meaning uh, where people are, where are they looking, and basically on top of all that he explained, he is the one that suffers uh, in the first place when things don't work, before things go to the hospital, and the first, uh, <laughs> the first person suffering from that is uh, Daniel, so, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, first you and then Lorian, right? <laughs> so my question would be, uh, what is the thing that we need to um, take care of more urgently? The thing that uh, poses like uh, the most important problem uh, right now, uh, or w one yeah. of the things maybe. <laughs> uh, I mean, the 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 challenge is, I think, which is that uh, everything comes from different places now. Like, we have uh, one model, I mean, I have, we have a lot of models, so we have models for speaker instruction, models for speech recognition, models. so they are all different uh, models, so and combining all those different pipelines of information at the same time is always going to be a challenge, like, if we could have, which is not sure, Possible, but if we have just one big end to end that just give the the answer of everything combined, maybe that will be simple as, as an architectural point and as an information retrieval point. Yeah, because uh, yeah, when you have a such a distributed systems, when one thing goes wrong, then even though everything is is right, things start getting out of. Uh, Thing, thing has to start not working well because you are relying on information, which I guess is the other problem. Like we are always relying on certain information to be accurate, which sometimes is not, and we are not that good at handling those cases because uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we need to always make certain assumptions. Now, when you have these systems, and the most uh, the first assumption is that things are going to work, and that's. Uh, that's a bad assumption to make, actually, because they never do. All right. Uh, let's thank uh, Daniel and Gabriel once more for the session. <laughs> <laughs>